Right, so let's talk Bolotti. This is something that a few people have been asking about because, as you may or may not know, they dry very well and they can be, they can be stored over winter in a dry form without freezing them. Um, and therefore it's a great crop for prepping in general, but to uh, store and eat over winter in soups from um, our harvest in your garden. So, how do they work? Let me just open right now. That one is already open, saves me using the other hand. So they look like this when they're ripe and they're beautiful, but when you cook them, they, they go brown. Um, so they, they lose this beautiful pattern, uh, but they're soft and um, fleshy, full of protein, amazing flavor. It's one of the best things really to eat in winter. Uh, they grow on climbing vines. There are some varieties which are uh, dwarf. I want to show you how to recognize when they're ready. So initially they're very green like this, and this is obviously not ready. If you look in there, the beans are not red yet, uh, but they look green too, hopefully. So I'm trying with one hand, which is not easy. So you see, this is not ready. Then they go like this, still kind of greenish, and you have to always look at the back, you see? So this is the front of the pod. And this is the back and the back is green i don't know if you can make it there you go so it's green so that tells me that this one is not ready yet either let me try and do it with one hand again there we go so and i'm and i see that the beans are still white now you can eat them now fresh but you can't uh, dry them and store them when they're at this stage but they're beautiful to eat and uh, you shouldn't necessarily throw them away if you pick them a bit too early but watch out for the green back of the pod. And then they go through all these phases when they're still green at the back, even though they might look ready at the front. And finally, they're ready when they're like this. So now the pattern has become more red and white. The back is white or inexistent, red. And then now, if you open these guys, they're fresh, but they've got that pattern in, in them. Uh, it's just proving a little bit more difficult than I thought. There you go, I use my teeth. There you go, so these are beautiful, plump, fresh bolotti. And then they'll go to the face that I showed you earlier on. Uh, they're essentially, I've lost it now, that where the, uh, this is similar to the one I've just shown you. And then essentially they'll start drying on the vine, on the climbing plant. And you see the nuts gone brownish and the inside has got a more defined marking pattern and it's gone beige and dark red now these are still fresh and i can tell because they're soft and they're juicy they will um, they'll be great to cook and eat now amazing flavor nothing beats that if you let them dry even more on the on the plant, but usually the climate in the UK is not very favorable for that, unless you grow them in a polytunnel, they start to go kind of papery and this starts to break. So this is not there yet. Uh, and uh, these become very hard and then essentially you can store them over winter. Now in the UK, that's quite rare that you manage to get them dry on the plant unless you do it in a polytunnel. So what you do is you pick them at this stage, which is as close as you will probably get. They're still, there's still some moisture in them. You see that this is not cracking open or um, shredding and ripping into papery bits and the beans are still quite soft. And so um, what you need to do is dehydrate them. The best thing is to use a dehydrator, but you could do it in the sun or in a drying cut board or something like that. And then when they're really hard, the beans, and these are really, sorry, these are very um, brittle. What you can do is walk on them so that these break or do it by hand but usually walking is a lot faster and then these come out and they're very hard and they're ready to go in a jar to be uh, stored over winter and then you can use them in soups but when you use them you need to uh, rehydrate them for you know 12 to 24 hours uh, so leave them soaking overnight but preferably for a whole 24 hours and then you can cook them as if they were fresh these are an amazing crop so i hope i didn't make it sound too complicated essentially they grow on a vine i'll show you the plant now and uh and then you can have a look so flavis picking some french beans behind her there are some uh bolotti bean vines i call them vines they're not really vines but they're climbing plants 
and so you can see here they grow up and they produce tons now we've been picking them for three weeks now these are perfect to eat fresh uh, restaurants like to cook with them because they're very difficult to find at this stage they're easy to find completely dehydrated but it's not the same texture it's not the same flavor there you go so this one is ready because it's all red at the back but there are some that want so this one are very ready they're starting to dry on the plant you can see and they're starting to be a bit more brittle like these guys here and then there you go these are also very ready so these are more fresh and these are more starting to dry I was looking for one that is not ready yet but I think they've all matured by now so they all got the white or red back uh, let me see yeah I think there you go so this one is still green and yeah the back is actually not very indicative because it's the whole thing is green but some of them will have a red front and a green back and that's a um, a telltale sign that it's not ready yet. All right, so this is bolotted beans. I've, I've um, convinced you that you should grow them and store them and eat them over winter. So this bed that I'm going to show you in a minute was a matte green like that one. You could you can tell one thing from another, and you get feel for it here. So there was some lettuce, almost hidden between the endive and a lot of chard, you know, huge chard. And what I've been doing is harvesting the lettuce and the endive so the endive gets cut very low and it will grow again stronger than ever um, and the um, and the lettuce get gets harvested only in terms of the outer leaves only the outer leaves come out and so this looks again relatively empty I've harvested also a lot of chard as you can tell those have been harvested from the middle so everything will look very clean by the end of this process a bit like it is over there I can do a bit of weeding in the process and uh, I'm harvested, I've harvested kilos of things, stimulating the whole system. Because whenever you cut one of these guys here, the endives, you get you give more vigor to the neighbors. Whenever you cut something that drastically, you um, invigorate the neighbors. And you see that there's light, there's airflow going in, avoiding fungal diseases, and everything looks a lot neater. And then in um, in two to three weeks, it will again look like. Uh, a huge mat of green. Uh, this is a key thing. It takes quite a bit of time to get in here and doing this. So it's not the most uh, labor, uh, labor saving, you know, uh, efficient practice. But for you guys who have, most of you have got just domestic settings. This is a fantastic way of growing a lot in a small space and making a lot of compost as well. Because a lot of the endive I take away, I don't even sell. I only sell the heart, which is very tender and, and slightly less bitter. And the outside goes all in the bin. In the compost bin so you're creating a lot of compost and you're invigorating your system and covering your soil and those roots will um, break down the clay so it's a win 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 situation okay with the background of the goldfinches <laughs> which were in, right next to me in the field a moment ago but i couldn't catch them on video um i want to do an update on squash so how do you know when your squash is ready? I've already done a video on that. Go and look up um, in the in the channel. Um, but I wanted to show you this. So essentially now all the foliage is going to die, die off, and the different um, types of squash will emerge. And then you can do what I've suggested in the previous video, which is check whether this part, where the fruit is connected to the stem, could that be? Still trying to pollinate um, is dry so this is clearly green and soft so it still needs to go a little bit longer and we have different varieties if you know uchikikuri or Japanese Hokkaido squashes they're really really sweet they're really nice very hard skin they store really well and they're relatively early as a squash um, this is a type of butternut that makes a funny a pumpkin like shape here you see that it's starting to dry up and then we have ute U-T-E, one of the best tasting squash in the world, a very ancient variety from the um, uh, South American continent. And um, you can see that the foliage is dying, don't worry about that, that's just a sign that the plant is putting all the energy into the fruit. And when the, the entire plant will be dead, you keep looking at that part there, and when it's completely dry, you're ready to harvest it but just to give you a feel for in the southwest in devon at the moment that's the situation these are late butternut squashes 
uh, the early uh, Uchikikuri they look more like this so don't don't panic and um, look at the abundance this is a part of the garden this is not inside the garden actually it's a new area that we wanted to clear for the long term and so essentially we've just put squash because they cover the ground suppress weeds and also they can do whatever they want out here and they produce really really well so this is a thing we get asked all the time what should we sow, be sowing now what have you got growing at the moment and so i'll try to do these videos more often to give you an update on what's growing this is our polytunnel propagation area for those of you who haven't seen it before i'm going to go through so we've got a lot of herbs this can go indoor so they they are sown now um to be planted in the tunnel later when the tomatoes come out the aubergine and the peppers come out and there's dill um Chinese violet, which can also be eaten as a flower and as a leaf, chervil, and you could have coriander, parsley and other things as well. Then we've got a lot of lettuce for indoors and, and a few for outdoors, but these ones are more for indoors because they're still behind. There's some radish, if you have problems sowing radish direct because the seeds get eaten or there's a lot of slugs, a lot of flea beetle, you can sow them multiple seeds per cell, up to five seeds per cell, but normally between two and, and four is fine. And then you can transplant them like you do for other plants. That's coriander. Uh, over here, they haven't come up yet, but this is spinach for winter. It can be for outside or for in inside. This is true spinach. Trombone variety. Uh, these actually are oriental greens, so mustards. That's also a very good thing to sow right until the end of September for outdoors. And in October, even for indoors. That's more lettuce. Then we've got more spinach. Uh, turnips, Tokyo turnips, the Japanese white, very sweet turnips. Uh, fennel. Fennel, now it, you can't sow it anymore, but you can transplant small plants if you buy them or, or um, had them in your propagation uh, area. Uh, lettuce, that's ready to go outside. This is ready to go outside. So if they're this size, they can still go outside. They'll crop for a bit. Uh, more lettuce, more lettuce. Then we've got coriander, not popped up yet. Um, over here we've got uh, more lettuces for indoors because they've been sown recently. Chicories. Uh, it's very late for chicories, but you know, ideally, if you want some chicories that ripe, that that mature very late, you could um, you could have sown them a couple of weeks ago. Now it's too late. Spinach. This is popping up. Not very good germination. We'll see. Usually, a very old seed of spinach is not very well performant, performing. Uh, lettuce. More lettuce. A rocket. Rocket is another one you can sow direct in the ground in a furrow or, or else in, in a seed drill or else you can sow it like this. Multiple seeds per cell and then you transplant it. The same thing there. Rocket. Mustards. These are ready. Asian greens. Uh, mustards. Mizunas. Uh, some very beautiful Komatsuna. A Choisum. A dragon Stong. A lot of different Asian greens and they can be also sown direct but we prefer to transplant them because they get less damage from slugs. Pak choys, lots of pak choys here. We grow a lot of pak choy. I don't know why we do because they don't sell very well, but they're an amazing crop. Very fast to grow. If you grow for your own consumption at home, please grow pak choy. Please learn to eat it because it's such an easy crop. The only problem they've got, and it's not a small one, but <laughs> admittedly it's the only one, um, is slugs. And the slugs would, will decimate a crop. But if you can get in, in um, on top of your slug pressure, and if you sow them when it's relatively dry, and if you you know stay on top of the of the so so my suggestion for for slug control in that case would be for a week or two go in the bed where you're going to put your pack choice and remove all the slugs by hand at night, so you reduce the population and then transplant these when they're quite nice and big. So you see we use big cells, um, and so when the plant is relatively big we plant it out and in two through three weeks it's ready. Uh, then more more dragon stung mustard chard for inside. For indoor growing, it's too late. That's kale, that's going to go outside soon. Um, more lettuce for indoor growing and some parsley, that's still good to go out. So this is what we've got growing at the moment. I'll give you an update next week. Let's see if I look to this guy here. Winter Marvel, lettuce brighter. So this is all lettuce. So I'll give you an update next week so you can get a feel for what we sow. We'll be sowing some more stuff next week as well. But the ones that you saw like this are the ones that we sowed. Uh, yeah, well, Flavio sowed yesterday, so um, the lettuces, the mustards, the rockets, the radishes, um, you can still sow now, and some herbs for indoor growing as well. So I wanted to quickly talk about a problem that you might get. So when you see kale growing this well, um, there, there might be problems that you're not seeing, actually. So this this bed has grown really, really well, even compared to that. I mean, this is ideal. And this is a bit too well, too, too good. And the reason is that we added a bit of chicken manure pellets here to, to test whether they perform better. Also because these beds, if you remember from previous videos, are very poorly performing 
um, this area of the garden has always been very compacted and very uh, with very low fertility. But anyway, what I wanted to say is that you can get some powdery mildew, which is common this year because it's been very dry and then a lot of rain all at once. Um, and that's not a huge deal, but some of these might have another problem. Let's have a look. Here you go. Here you see it a little bit. Some aphids, you see there? Those grey things. And this one is not too damaged, but some of them have got tons of aphids, and so you need to clean them really well before cooking them or selling them. And um, that's due to extra nitrogen. It means that the leaf has got more nitrogen, higher nitrate content. If you saw an infestation, which is definitely not the case here, it would mean that they've got really too many, too much nitrogen. And that's a sign of uh, having fertilised too much or <clears throat> having fertilised with the wrong thing. Now, chicken manures are usually balanced. They've got a lot of calcium and, you know, quite a, quite a bit of nitrogen. But um, it's rare with organic chicken manure pellets to, to get, unless you put really a lot, to get really bad um, over fertilisation. But, you know, this guy looks a lot healthier than the others. And... And actually, it doesn't have any aphids, for example. But you know, watch out for these problems. When mildew gets really bad, powdery mildew, you see it like that, and you can see it also on the stem. You see over here, there's a bit of graying, grey mold on the stem. It's fine. These plants will do fine. Actually, what helps in these cases is to pick everything right to the top and leave only these few leaves in the middle. So the plant looks like a tree, like a palm tree, but it, it does a lot of good to the plant because the airflow helps uh, kill the mildew and, um, and also removing all those uh, leaves uh, reduces the risk of slugs and things like that. Well, let me show a way to <laughs> deal with dock, which is a typical weed in clay soil um, and especially compacted soils of any type. Um, when it's next to a vegetable bed like this, so this is next between the path and the vegetable bed, so we've got cavalry and arrow here. Obviously, you can treat this as any other plant, and I've told you many times that whenever you prune a plant or harvest a plant heavily like this, and you leave only the top leaves, you are sending signals via the soil network to the neighbouring plants and, and strengthening them and stimulating them. So you can treat pruning or harvesting very heavily as a biostimulant action onto the neighbouring plants. Um, and so you can do the same for weeds. So one way to deal with this guy is to cut. Now with one hand it's going to be very difficult. Let me just give it a go. should have a knife somewhere over here. Look, there's a slug there. So that's going to go in the, in the field next door. There we go, so I've got my knife. So rather than remove it, so there's two options. One is to go in there and dig it up. Uh, dig as much of, of, of it as you can. And when you do that, you'll break the root at some point because it's very hard to get the whole root out because it's very deep. And then this will come back. And that's fine. That's one way of doing it. The other way is to cut it there. Or, you know, even a little bit underneath, a bit, a bit lower than the surface. Okay. So I could do it that way. Now, with one hand, it's quite difficult. So bear with me. There you go. So it seems disappeared, but obviously it will come back. And that's okay, because I'm going to use this for compost. Well, this is amazing composting material. And when this comes back, I'm going to cut it again, and again, and again. So in a small garden, this will become a compost source and a stimulation source for this guy here. And, and you will see that this guy, I've been doing that a few times, and this guy is very healthy, also compared to some of its neighbours. And this might be due to many things, but... I'm sure that a little bit of that is due to the constant stimulation that the dock does. The dock will, it's great food for worms, so there obviously are a lot, of, a lot more worm castings around the root zone of this guy because the, the worms are attracted by the dock. The dock also attracts a lot of microbes because it's a very, you know, very um, nutritious weed in terms of its exudates, of the sugars that it sends to the soil around the root. And also it decompacts the soil, so obviously this guy will benefit from the channels that the dock creates. And on top of that, whenever I cut, I make some compost and I give it another boost, another pulse of growth. So that's a quick tip for you about managing dock. Quite a funny thing I'm going to show you <laughs> now. This is a cabbage, red cabbage, like this guy, that has been harvested. And if you harvest it clean, you can also remove the leaves, the outer big leaves. 
to leave the stump clean like this, what happens is you get some mini cabbages on the side. And these are amazingly good to ferment, to eat, uh, cooked, raw, make slow with, they're really, really nice. And um, it happens only once. I mean, you could cut again and you could get another one, but usually they don't, they don't, get as ni they don't become as nice with the second cut. And if I were to do that now, so the first cut I did to remove the main head, which was as big as that one, and then I'm getting these guys, and then I'm gonna harvest for example now and I'm going to make a cut, a clean cut, around here because where the leaves, you see these are the leaves that have been removed or have fallen off and rotted, um, when, where there is a leaf there is a node so you see that gem there, it's, uh, so from there you can get a new sprout like this and so they only get activated if you cut everything that's on top of them. At the moment they're dormant because the top of the plant sends a hormone, uh, hormone down that stops everything else from growing. Once you remove the top, then these gems become viable and they start fighting for whoever becomes the leader. And in doing so, they produce some food. So that's a tip for you. In some variety of cabbages, rather than getting mini cabbages on the side, so this is again the same thing, we cut, you see here the cut where the main head was. Uh, they've all gone these actually, but we made a cut like that to remove the main head, sorry. And then what happens is you get the same effect, but with loose mini heads. And these are really tasty. These are like spring greens, mini spring greens, amazing to eat. Fantastic. You don't need, even need to cook them very long. Just gently steam them or stir fry them or, or boil them very gently, blanch them and they become a fantastic side dish. So very, very quick video about um, when plugs are ready to go out. So this is lettuce that's going to go out in the field uh, today. And I know these are ready also because of the tops, but um, sometimes the top can be misleading. They, you know, plants don't look like they're ready um, and they might be ready or the other way around. Like, you know, if you look at these radishes, I know that these can be pushed out and planted already today, probably better tomorrow, even though they look like they haven't even developed true leaves. You see, some of them have. Some of them have just got cotyledons, which are the first leaves, two leaves, which are not really true leaves. They're already pre-developed within the seed. These guys here, for example, I know these already, uh, but again, you know, it's not enough to look at the tops. What you need to do is try and push one out, like I'm doing here. Never pull. Uh, you always have to push things out. And then you lift it, and then you look at the, root, um, at the root development. Now, this is a perfect plug. This is ready to go out uh, straight away. And I know because it stays together, it's not falling apart. Um, the roots are not silking or circling around. You see that they're self-pruned where the hole was. And, and there's no root um, boundedness. So they're not really circling around and strangling the plant. Uh, but the thing holds together. It's fairly wet. So this is ready to go out. I always recommend that you water your plants a few hours before transplanting them. Not straight before transplanting them, but a few hours before. And the best way of doing that is to put them on a tray full of water and so they soak it up from the bottom and when you see the water reach the top because because of um, capillarity uh, then you can uh, you can transplant them but otherwise you can water them from the top just be careful to to let the water soak in to the full plug but yeah so those were ready let's have a look at these so again I'm gonna push it out the fact that it's coming out easily means that it might be ready yeah that's perfect again the roots are not circling around they're not um, keeping constraining the plant they're self pruned but the whole thing stays together and it's full of roots but with some uh, soil with some uh, substrate showing let me show you something that might be a bit too late now how do i know that this is too late these leaves usually they go yellow but in this case because of the plant they've gone purple you see like this guy here is a bit healthier because it doesn't have any of those purple leaves it's doing a bit better when they start having um, dark purple, but usually yellow leaves, it means that they're struggling for nutrients. So they should have been transplanted earlier. If you transplant them now, the plant will suffer some uh, weakness and it might never recover. So I'm going to try and push it out. And there we go. So you see this guy is dry, for one. That's no good. You see that the roots are circling around? That's a sign that it should have been planted earlier, when the roots were all kind of pointing down. Now, this plant will struggle to establish itself in, in the field. Because it will, the roots will only grow within this plug for a while. And then after a week or so, they'll, they'll start to significantly go into the soil. That means that you have to water this guy for at least a week because it won't be able to find water for itself. And also, you know, this indicates nutrient deficiency. And you know very well in human nutrition as well, if somebody 
suffers from malnutrition or nutrient deficiency when they're young they don't develop very well and that might stay with them for life so hopefully that gives you um, a tip on how to transplant i know that this is something that a lot of people have got questions about please 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 drop me any questions in the comments and i'm very happy to, to answer any of them um yeah I, I'd, I'd love for this channel to be as interactive as possible so don't be afraid to ask anything i thought i'd share a little bit of a very general principle that we use over winter and it's something we've had always um, as a priority to try and learn how to do it better and it's uh, keeping the soil covered over winter so not having any empty beds over winter so as you can see there are a lot of things that have been transplanted recently and we're, we're transla transplanting sorry um still we'll we'll have some more things going in tomorrow we'll have some more things going in in a week um and in two weeks as well and then the time for uh, things to go out in the field will be um, gone because it, they wouldn't have enough time to get big enough to survive uh, throughout the early part of the winter or even the, the entire winter so here we're going to transplant some more and right now these guys have flowered we're going to remove the ones that are flowered and use the ones that we can use and two more successions of radishes will go in there so you can notice how full the garden is considering that it's um we got, we're heading into winter, so most, most of the uh, gardens, vegetable gardens, farms are looking emptier and emptier by the day. Um, whereas we've got uh, crops in most of the garden. I'm going to quickly take the opportunity to give you a tour without necessarily telling you what everything is. But you will see uh, what the garden looks like this time of the year. Um, and it's been, as I've said, a goal of ours to try and maintain the garden this covered over winter. So this... Um, are all crops that will keep producing over winter. There's broccoli, there's red cabbage and parsnips, and uh, there's more kale here. Now, after the these guys, this is a very poor part of the garden, and the soil has always been problematic. After Flavia harvests the seeds here, there'll be more crops. This will stay over winter. These guys will stay uh, for as long as they don't flower. More kale, more kale, so this will all stay over winter. And then these guys will replace very soon with something else. There's some pack choice. These are flowered, so we'll replace some of them soon. So literally, I can't see a bed that will remain empty at this stage. I mean, there will be some that will remain eventually empty. And what we'll do is we'll plant a green manure in them. And because it will be very late, um, what we will do is plant a um, uh, field beans and black oats green manure that can um, germinate very late. You can see new plantings of lettuce and fennels just that just went in and here uh, there's carrots in the middle a few radishes have gone to flower from the previous planting and then there's uh, french beans so when the french beans will come out there'll still be the carrots in there and then we'll plant something on the side same thing here french beans and beetroots so interplanting helps with that in with with this strategy because when you remove a summer crop you still have something um, that remains in the middle and then you just need to fill in the gaps that have formed on the, on the side. I've recently cut this uh, chard and the beans will come out so the, this whole bed will change dramatically in a couple of weeks or so. We might put a green manure in there actually, a grass one. And over here our syntropic or experimental beds. So the whole garden will be covered with green. And, and this is, you can't, it's difficult to express how happy I am to be seeing this because in the first few years we were trying to learn as much as we could uh, about our soil, about our systems, about our markets as well in order to be able to constructively keep the um, soil covered over winter with living plants that, and the majority of these plants would be um, productive cash crops so things that we can sell rather than just stuff that covers the ground and improves the soil. And I think we've um, found a good balance now, and uh, it does uh, it does feel really good to be able to see the garden. And I will update you on this in uh, hopefully November or so, and you uh, and you will see what it looks like in November. It won't be perhaps as full, and it won't look as lush, but I still oh, look at the coffee just going into the field and eating the chickweed. And I still, but I think it will still be uh, pretty full compared to other systems there you go Ooh, wanted to get a bit closer anyway i've been rambling on for um enough time i will um uh, see you in the next video and good stuff right so i'm turning the compost and that's um, something 
uh, that um, we get a lot of questions about. So how, what, it, what does it mean to turn the compost? How often do you do it? So this is what the compost looks like. We've been adding a lot actually right just today. Roger, get out of there. Sorry, the dog is a bit. Roger, come around this way. And, um, and the stuff that was here that I've just been turning into the third bay, so this stuff here is at least two months old. Um, well, it's actually more than that. It's at least four months old, but it's been turned in there two months ago and now it's been turned again today. So it's spent two months, approximately two months, not, lot, not all of it, obviously, because the, you know, the bits at the top have been there only, um, only half the time that the ones at the bottom have on average. And then they spend two months in here and then they'll spend at least another month in here and then we'll apply it to the, uh, to the garden. You could see that it's still quite warm and you, hopefully, I don't know how much of that you can see, but it's still steaming off even though it's been for two months in there. Um, and it's relatively, um, it's got relatively a large amount of woody and fibrous material, but that's deliberate. We want that to add aeration and fungal uh, components. Uh, and also, you know, to have a good balance between carbon and nitrogen. But then you could sieve this away, uh, the, the woody part, the woody part, and then you get a material that is really compost-like. Now, if you imagine this without the woody bits, this is really like good compost. Yeah, have a look at that. Uh, so this is lovely stuff. Uh, and this is only in six months if you do it properly. And doing it properly mean, means mixing the right amounts of greens and browns. You know, high carbon and high nut and more high, um, relatively high nitrogen materials. Turning, so in, when I'm turning, what I do is I, ma I make sure that the stuff that was in the middle ends up on the sides, the stuff that was at the bottom ends up at the top, and so everything gets really mixed and, and everything gets equally hot. Um, and so turning is really important. And then what's really important, a lot of people uh, not don't pay, you know, overlook is the fact of having a large enough system. So this is uh, 2.4 by 1.8, uh, by 1.2 I think high so it's really large um, it's a bit like having two pallets two pallets on each side and one pallet height um, so that makes a huge difference because then the pile has enough bulk to um, start the heating process and um, bacteria and fungi and, and all the other microbes can travel within the pile very easily so what's in an autumn salad um, as, as, as a full tradition I'm just going to go through the things we add to our uh, autumn and winter salads. This is called choi sum, an incredibly tasty stem, uh, leaf and flower vegetable uh, which can be eaten raw in salads. It's really tasty and juicy. Then we've got the lettuces, so we've got canasta, maureen. Um, this is a mustard called uh, ruby streaks. This is Chinese leaf, uh, kaboko. This is a um, black seeded simpson lettuce. This is a mizuna called beniushi, really, really good uh, looking and also tasty. Uh, little gem in dread. This is a baby kale called Red Rubble, uh, Cherbiata, you've seen it before. This is a Red Ikyo called 506TT, really good, slightly bittersweet flavour. Red Russian kale, small leaves, and this is called Jabek, it's a cos lettuce. Then we've got some Rocket, uh, this is uh, just cultivated Rocket, a Gilad lettuce, a Scarlet um, a Chinese leaf, and then some Endive or Undive uh, called Wallone. W A W L, -L O N E, and so this is how it looks. Then obviously we've got some pea shoots, some some flower shoots, and some nasturtiums. And there might be some more additions as we go into the winter. A little bit more radicchio. There's a yellow and a pink variety of radicchio, and this one will disappear because we haven't got tons of it. Some yellower endive, and some more Asian greens, for example, some different types of mustards and different types of lettuce. We'll have some more frilly lettuces, but approximately this will stay like this for the winter as well. Broccoli on this side, that'll be my shadow as well, but beautiful cabbages, beetroots and, and um, cabbages, uh, cabbage beetroot, more cabbage, more beetroot interplanted with leeks. Here, yeah, more cabbages, leeks, leeks, lots of varieties of leeks, charred and Chinese leaf. And on this side, we've got Asian greens under the net, more Asian greens without net, radishes, radishes. You've got some fennel and lettuce, charred and kale, carrots under the net. Over here in the shade of the cauliflowers, we've got fennel and lettuce. 
and we saw something in this soon. Then we'll then let us look at the beauties, the beauty of those colours. Uh, here we've got some French beans and carrots, chard and lettuce, beetroot and beans. On the other side we've got perpetual spinach, chard and mustard. Look at these. Mustard, <laughs> a volunteer tomato and chard. Lettuce and fennel, broccoli and fennel, French beans and leeks, fennel and lettuce, bolotti beans and chard, chard beans, fennel, and beetroots and chard over there, and Chinese leaf with fennel and chicory on the side. Here there's kale and fennel and parsley on the side, broccoli and fennel. This is a mixed bed, very mixed. And let's go to the other side. It's not proper tool, but I thought the light was nice. It'd be good to have a look at things. Chinese leaf coming out in the next week. Carrots. What's in here? Turnips. Lettuces transplanted a few days ago. Carrots. These are coming out soon. Pak choys. Roger is barking. And uh, rocket and mustards, more mustards. Look at the beauty of these colours. And then we've got uh, chicories. Let me go across pack choice chicories. Broccoli and fennel. Celery. I want to see the celery better. It's too dark. And here we've got radishes, and here we've got turnips. Here I'm going to sow something today. Look at this rocket. And then fennels coming along nicely. Asian greens. And kale, kale town. Back to this stuff. The light is not fantastic, I'm just going to turn around. Yeah, kale city here. With a volunteer borage in there. Several successions. Mustards. Parsley. And that's approximately it. Small bits, but... So at the market today, carrots, leeks, fennel, microgreens, salad, a petri spinach, rocket, stir fry, baby kale, courgettes, parsley, cauliflower, pak choy, chard. And we got some nice bolotti, French beans, cherry tomatoes, and shallots, rana beans, broccoli, all sorts of broccoli, green, purple, cucumbers. And then on the top we got beetroot, bring onions, kale, different types of kale, radish and basil. Here's a tip for you when you're going to remove your squash. We've already discussed this in previous videos on this channel. Um, you should make sure that this part is dry. Now if you scratch it with your finger you'll see if it comes off soft and green. This is still a bit soft. And still not completely ready. Now this type of squash here tends to ripen very late but then it's easy to distinguish when it's dry or not so this is already drying quite a lot because it's very hard and it's not um, even though it looks green it looks quite woody so it's about ready it's um, it's nearly ready to be picked. Now if you're unsure and you don't want to risk it two things so first of all why would you need this to be dry because if it's still wet and soft it means that that's, there is a hole in in this um, at the center of this uh, connection here and that's the hole through which the plant sends sugars into the fruit that's why these leaves are dying off it's because all the sugars and all the nutrients from these leaves are going into the fruit and into the seeds inside this fruit now uh, if you cut it too early like for example at, um, at the stage where this guy's this guy is 
what happens is you'll find a massive hole in, in the middle there and that hole is where fungi and rot can get in. There is still a way to avoid that even though you're unsure whether your pumpkin is ready or not, your squash is ready or not. And it's to cut, rather than cut through here, is to cut here and there. So that you cut in an area um, which is not necessarily um, directly connected to your pumpkin and which will dry a lot faster. Then you can let your squash cure in the sun. So first of all, let me show you what I mean. You'd pick it like that. Okay, so you cut here, you cut there, so that this peduncle, this area here, this connection is not um, open, it's not cut open. And then you would, you would cure this in the sun, in a covered space, obviously, frost-free, uh, possibly in a polytunnel or greenhouse, uh, for as long as it's needed for this to look very, very, very dry. And then you store it over winter and up to a year, even more than a year in some cases, in a, in a warm temperature, at a warm temperature. So, so that would be a house, somebody, somewhere where the temperature, temperature is higher than 15 degrees. So, um, to, re, to, 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 to recap, try and cut your pumpkin when this is quite dry and it looks very, very woody. Let me give you an example. For example, this one is already a lot better. You can see it looks very woody. This guy here. It looks woody, even though it's not ready yet, but it's getting there. And second thing is, when you harvest it, cut here and there, rather than cutting across here. And third thing is, store it, leave it in the sun to cure, to make its skin very hard and impervious to fungi, for at least a week, if not two, uh, in the hottest area you have uh, outside. And then bring it inside and store it always above uh, 12, 15 degrees to avoid it rotting. Talking of squashes, we've got several varieties here that you might consider for next year. This is called Ute Indian. You can find it from real seeds. It's an open pollinated one. It's supposed to be one of the best testing squash in the world. We can't confirm that yet because we haven't tried any. This is one of my favorite, actually my very favorite squash. It's called Autumn Crown. Unfortunately, it's a hybrid, Autumn Crown F1. But it's beautiful because it's like a butternut squash that looks like a pumpkin. I love that. And then we've got Uchikikuri. That's a smallish one, actually, but very, very early one. Very hard, very well store, um, very very good at storing, and uh, yeah, very good taste. Very hard to cut though, because it's got very thick skin, which makes it a good storer. This one, a commercial variety called Kabucha F1. This is a hybrid again, whereas that one was a an, an open pollinated seed. Um, very 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 good taste and an incredible incredibly incredible texture. So the the flesh holds well and it roasts well. Uh, it stays quite firm. And we don't have any more here actually. Hello, so um, one thing that you will be doing a lot in your vegetable garden so this time of the year is clearing out summer crops and replacing them with winter crops. Now, in this case we had an interplanting of uh, bolotti beans and chard. You can see it here, bolotti beans climbing up and chard on the side. In this case taking a lot of the sun, so they're actually loving it now that it's cooler. Whereas over here we had the same thing, now it's been removed, the trellis has been removed, but we had the same thing, just mirror reflection, so just uh, inverted, with on the northern side the chard, and in the middle the bolotti beans. So this chard was in the shade, which was amazing during the summer, so it produced a lot more during the summer, and now it's struggling a little bit, because obviously it gets shaded out. But it's not going to be a problem, because this trellis will come down in a day or two. So... We want to replace the beans with something else. First of all, look at the soil. Uh, the soil I haven't had any compost, and this is just how the beans left the soil, full of roots, obviously. So what I did is I cut, I removed the trellis, I cut the plants right um, uh, underneath the surface level, so that the roots remained in, but the top of the plants came off. And now um, the second thing, which is very important, if you're going to plant things alongside an established plant. Um, you have to uh, prune, strategically prune, your uh, established plant. So if I were to put, I'm going to put pak choys in here. Flavia is just getting them ready. If we put the pak choys in here alongside a very vigorous plant that has got roots all over the place, so the roots of chard are very long, um, this pak choys will never do well and they'll go yellow and very weak because they're too close to a big plant. So the way to, uh, uh, to buffer that effect to um, moderate that effect is to prune these very heavily and we've done that we've removed a lot of leaves left just a few in the middle and we'll harvest actually most of these bigger ones tomorrow 
So these plants will remain very, very um, vegetative, very juvenile, even though they're quite old, but we'll leave only the younger plants so that the best part of the plant is in its juvenile phase. When you do that, a lot of the roots self-prune. A lot of the roots that are around the plant will just self-prune and become food for microbes. So rather than have a competition effect, you will get a collaboration effect, a synergistic effect. So when you plant things uh, near the roots of these guys, you get some positive effect because these guys will be a home for the biology for the microbes and when they self prune their roots in response to the pruning that you've done of the tops of the canopy that those roots and those microbes will be available for the pack choice and so uh, that's very good practice whenever you're going to plant uh, small plants next to big plants do prune very heavily as heavily as you can uh, in this case pruning is also harvesting so it's quite convenient uh, do do that to your established plants before you put the new ones. So just found some King's Trofaria mushrooms that were inoculated in the pathways here. And uh, this area wasn't disturbed for a long time, so you can see it's a bit weedy as well. But these are lovely to eat straight away. There's slugs like that, so it's important to eat them before they get completely damaged. And they'll pop up throughout the autumn now in the areas where you don't tread on. So these ones will leave, so tomorrow they'll be ready. Giant wine cap, wine cap or King's Trofaria mushrooms that grow on, mush, on uh, wood chip. So these are carrot beds, and as you can see, they're covered with mesh for carrot fly. Um, so this prevents the carrot fly from going in and burrowing into the roots and then damaging it, because then they start to rot. Um, the the one thing we do every year to monitor the situation with carrot fly is so one bed of carrots per season per as in per succession which is completely outside the net to check whether there is any problem as a control uh, bed so i'm going to pull a carrot up here and you can see that there's no carrot fly damage whatsoever so we're in our third year and uh, even though the conditions were very favorable for carrot fly we didn't see much in this bed that was completely outside the net so in principle we could have saved us a lot of work by not putting the net on but you never know so it's something that I, I, I recommend everybody does is just to leave some plants outside any protection so that you can monitor how your garden with its biodiversity is becoming more and more um, resistant as a whole to pest attacks okay I wanted to quickly um, show you an experiment we're making which is to use um, ship fleece for mulch. I would recommend to do this only in perennial areas um, because obviously the, this will take a long time to break down, which is positive because it's going to do a, a nice, uh, it's going to have a nice mulching effect. Uh, but also it can be a problem if you want to put plants into it um, in spring, for example. So this is a perennial bed, uh, which means they're all things that don't get um, transplanted and replanted. Oh, there's a kestrel. Have a look up there. And you can't see how I need to zoom in. That's a kestrel. There you go. Anyway, so this is a um, so this is a perennial bed. There's Chinese artichokes. There's ochre. Uh, there's globe artichokes that have now died down and will produce again next year. There's some skirret. There's some fennel. There's some perennial kales. Jerusalem artichokes. More perennial kales. There were strawberries here. Now we plant something else in here. But essentially, the the idea with the fleece is that it keeps the soil warm. Uh, slugs don't like it and it suppresses weeds. It's really thick, it looks really good, but it smells when you touch it. It does smell, not when you go past it though, unless you really touch it with your hands and then you get the smell in your hands of the lanolin and all the oils. Um, but it, yeah, it's a great material uh, for perennial uh, mulching. I don't still know what the effect is on slugs. I've heard that obviously because the slugs need to crawl and to slide on top of their slime, such a surface as a um, fleece because it's very rough and it's not got any smooth uh, area it doesn't allow them to lay their, uh, their, their slime and slide on it very easily so they struggle they get tired and they give up um, the problem though that i have in mind that might happen here is that there might be rats or mice hiding under it because it will be warm under there so in winter they might hide under there and i'm sure we'll find holes of voles and things like that underneath. So every now and then I'll, I'll have a poke with Roger and we'll try to, to kill a few mice, I'm afraid. Right, I know I've talked about this before in the, 
in the channel. I'm going to do an, another video on this just because I've just realized we have a lot of parasitoid wasps. So this is damage from caterpillars, but you can see that it started and then it stopped. You know, you, you will all have mm, evidence of when damage from a caterpillar on a kale plant like this, Cavalonero, can strip the whole uh, plant, leaving only the stalk, uh, the white stalk in the middle and, and just the skeleton of the plant, literally. But obviously, whatever was going on here, um, different types of cabbage white butterflies um, were seen in the in the um, in the greenhouse in the, the polytunnel at different times, and uh, some caterpillars must have started munching on this uh, cavalonero, but then they stopped. And uh, very likely, what's happened is the uh, parasitoid wasp um, Cortesia glomerata attacked them, and I'm going to show you a few signs that confirm that. Uh, all around the, the, the polytunnel, I've found uh, these cocoons. There you go. So these are the cocoons of Cortesia glomerata that have been uh, wrapped up um, in silk by a caterpillar. So there must have been a caterpillar on here. Sometimes cabbage white butterflies will lay eggs in odd places like on a post or on, a tree, on tree bark or even on mesh like this. We've had it before. And obviously what, what's happened here is that the caterpillar started to protect the, um, the cocoons. And then when, um, when it died, it disappeared, it dried up, it shriveled and probably fell on the ground. And uh, these guys are now about to um, hatch and get out. Um, hatch is not the right word, but they'll come out of their cocoons and, and become uh, young wasps. Um, and I've um, just noticed we have a lot more of these. They might be on that plant as well. They probably were at some point, but it's just easier to see them when they are on objects like these. And you can see here... Uh, that the larvae are uh, in the cocoons and I thought I'd seen another one but I might be... there you go so these ones are at a different stage it's not more yellowy we're looking at them from the back here so obviously they don't look the same usually normally unless there's been a caterpillar on them and so there's this silk on they might just look like yellow fluffy things and so in that sense um, this is a bit more similar to what you'd see on your plants you know if I remove I might actually try it's it's quite hard I don't want to damage them but if you were to remove the silk and at earlier stage they would be very very bright yellow okay so that's Cortesia glomerata have a look on the channel at previous posts and you'll see what it does but essentially controls cabbage white caterpillars for you quick update on tomatoes at this stage of the year you can remove all of the leaves and just leave the tomatoes on the st on the stems and on the on the fruiting stalks, you don't need any of the leaves at this stage. Any of the ones that have started ripening will finish ripening, even though it will be a very slow process at this stage. But the more sunshine, the quicker this happens. And also, removing the leaves allows for airflow, which uh, reduces the uh, chance of getting fungal diseases. Uh, that is true of cucumbers to some extent as well. You can leave a few more leaves on those, but. Again, the leaves are going to get diseased now with downy mildew and other problems. And so the best idea is to remove as many of the leaves as possible. And we do that as much as it makes sense to do. Obviously, these plants are going to come out in um, a couple of weeks, perhaps two or three weeks. And so there's only so much work that's worth doing on them. Um, now we, it might as well be a matter of just leaving them to their own devices for a while and then removing them definitively ultimately when they're meant to come out there's no sign of late blight there was a little bit of blight in, in the beef tomatoes a while ago they've all slowed down because they really love it hot and so um, yeah there is actually a bit of blight here we had cured healed the first lot and now we have just uh, um, stopped really worrying and a little bit of it's, it's coming in this is phosphorus deficiency you see this purpling of the leaves that sometimes if it's extreme gets them really dry but at this stage it will be due to temperature in the root zone and in the air and also perhaps a little bit of blight um, but that's totally okay so this is actually phosphorus deficiency and then in some cases uh, it can be mistaken for blight blight happens in, in a very different in a different way at a different scale and the plant really gets weakened all of a sudden because it's a disease and so that one I suspect is late blight uh, but yeah you can see it there but that's fine these plants are going to come out and we're going to sell them or use them for chutneys as green tomatoes and the red ones will ripen in their own time moving into october 
vegetables are changing. Leeks, broccoli, beans, 